。うんと、今から。よいしょ。えっ、ー、と、通訳機能の確認をしたいんですが、通訳さん、ちょっと喋ってもらってもいいですかセスさんいらっしゃいますかはい、えっ、ー、と、聞こえております。ちょっとここ、はい、お声が小さいかもしれませんが、よろしくお願いします。はい、はい、助かります。えー、失礼します。聞こえますでしょうか。あ、ケンさん、よろしくお願いします。同時通訳設定お願いします。どうもすみません。同日約設定の会場音声、えー、入るようにお願いします。
Uh, Alex, if you can hear me, I can't hear you. Oh. Oh. Can you hear me now? I can hear the hall. I yeah, can hear I can... you, Alex. And yeah. now I, we all I, good? Uh, not yet. I need to be set up as a simultaneous interpreter, so otherwise you can't speak uh, continually without being interrupted by me. Uh -huh. and, and just a brief note, I don't think it's germane to you because you're very methodical in your speech, but uh, I tell speakers not to speak too fast uh, because the interpreter cannot keep up if you speak really, really fast in your native language. Yeah, got it. I'll try not to talk too fast. Yeah, it shouldn't be a problem. All right, just let me know when you're ready for me to go. Okay. Uh, is Ken Matsumoto there? Matsumoto-san, please accept it. Please え、ご自身はい、どうも。さん、今川口さんが対応してます。ちょっとお待ちください。はい、すいません。え、進行中事務局の方必ず日本語チャンネル誰かセットしてください。それでないと通訳者からの悲鳴が聞こえません。わかりました。すいません。気をつけます。い
、えー、とセスさんに連絡でする、えーと、もう少しお待ちください。今、川口さんが対応しています。もう一回、えー、とアレックスに話しかけてもらって、あ、ちょっと違う。セスさん、もう一回、えーと、アレックスに話しかけてもらっていいですか多分これで、えー、と声が通ってると思います。Yeah, yeah. Yeah, okay. Are we good to go? All right. Thank you very much. Dozo Yoroshku Onogai Shamas. That's all the Japanese I know. So the rest will be in English. Thank you very much for joining me today.、Uh, I call out all the organizers. All the speakers, all the sponsors, all the volunteers, and all of the people here today that make Scrum Tokyo a wonderful place to be. So, thanks for joining me today. Um, we're not showing the stuff on the screen here. Bear with me. Hang on. We're getting there. I did have slides. We're fixing technology. <laughs> We're figuring stuff out here. So, in the room, we're not displaying the slides on the screen, just so you know what's going on. Okay. Share screen again. Technical difficulties. It's not showing the slide deck. And they're beautiful slides, too. Okay. Okay. We all good to go? All right. Thank you for being patient.、Um, Remember before the pandemic, nobody used QR codes. Now we all use QR codes. Here's my QR code. What you can do is you can download the slide deck and follow along, or you can look at the slide deck later. But this is for you if you want to get the slide deck. All right. We're getting there.
It's not displaying the slides. Oh, there it goes. Okay. Oh, okay. All right. Welcome to the Kanban practices. All. I am your wizard today, a Kanban wizard. My name is Alex Slowly. I'm from Sydney, Australia, but I'm not originally from Australia. I'm from Seattle in the United States. And I grew up, I became an adult at Microsoft. And Seattle is where I learned all about Kanban. I do a lot of Kanban. I even married a Kanban trainer. This is my wife, Sally. She's an accredited Kanban trainer. And our kids use Kanban at home. And I'm talking about Kanban at a Scrum conference. But that's okay. You can use Kanban on Scrum teams too. So I want to talk about the Kanban practices. Uh, maybe you're not familiar with the Kanban practices. Bear with me. It's connecting again. We just had a little technical issue again. Okay. I think I might be able to fix this myself. Let's see. Hopefully I fixed it. We'll find out. If we're lucky, it's fixed. How come you didn't have these issues, Heidi? <laughs> oh, there we go. It's back up on the screen now. Okay. Um, so that's a little bit about me. But let's get to our topic today. We're going to talk about the Wizard Tower of Kanban. If you're not familiar with Kanban, you might learn something a little new today. There are six practices in Kanban as we use them on software teams. These are the six practices of Kanban. And for the sake of translation, I'll go ahead and read them off. The first practice is visualizing, making things visible. The second practice is limiting work in process. Work in process is sometimes called WIP. Managing flow is the third practice. The fourth practice, making policies explicit. Policies is just a fancy English word for rules. So on a Kanban team, you make the rules explicit or obvious. The fifth practice of Kanban is you have some type of feedback loop in your team. In a traditional scrum team, you have feedback loops at the end of every sprint. Well, we have feedback loops in Kanban as well. And finally, the sixth practice, improve and evolve. You are now familiar with the six practices as defined by Kanban. But the question is, of these six practices, does a successful Kanban team have to do all of these and do them very well? Maybe there's only one practice you really have to do well on a Kanban team, and that's the one ring to rule them all. But let's explore each of these practices and see where that takes us. The first practice we'll explore
the first practice we'll explore Ah, uh, here's the first practice we're going to explore. We're going to explore visualization. The KMPs are the Kanban management professionals. And they're very invested in visualizing their work. You can see this wizard is visualizing his work using sticky notes a very common practice for Kanban teams to have, visualizing on sticky notes. But you could visualize in software, for example. It is one of the six practices, but is it the most powerful practice? Does a Kanban team have to visualize? All right, we've got technical issues. I'm stopping the screen sharing. And start again. Yeah, start again. Yeah. <clears throat> All right, I apologize for the delay there. All right. So let's visualization. Do you really need visualization? Well, there are teams with people who have limited vision. They can't see. So how can a Kanban team with a team member who can't see or who has limited vision, how can they be on a successful Kanban team? And in fact, you really need to use vision at all on a Kanban team, even though visualization is one of the six practices. Can you use your other senses? Can you use your senses of taste or smell or touch? There are many different types of signaling systems in the world that do not rely on sight. You can buy sticky notes that are edible, flavored sticky notes. Can you imagine a Kanban team using flavored edible sticky notes? You wouldn't have to see the sticky notes at all. You would just have to taste them to understand what the work is. You can buy sticky notes that smell. What if you used Kanban tickets that smelled like something. You can buy tools designed for people who have low vision that you can put on things. They're like little recordable buttons. Can you imagine a Kanban team with recordable buttons that you press the, press the button and it said something like, my work is this? on this sticky note. And all of these things exist in the real world, like foghorns warning boats not to come near the shore when there's a lot of fog. So this article right here is an actual scientific article 
about a Kanban team with a team member who had low vision. That person on that Kanban team couldn't see at all. And yet this Kanban team was still successful and they wrote a case study and published it. And that's the link. That was the link right there. So do you really need to visualize on a Kanban team? My answer is no, you do not. All you need to do is make the work accessible, but not necessarily visual. Which brings me to Kanban practice number two. <laughs> Just a moment, technical issues. Right, that's a backlog. No take questions from the crowd. Like a handbag question? Do I have a comment question? Mm. Uh, Do you have a Kanban question, Z? Have you worked with people Have I ever worked on a Kanban team that had accessibility requirements? I have not actually personally worked on a Kanban team with someone with accessibility issues. I have worked on waterfall teams with people who have accessibility challenges. Um, what I can say is that it requires the whole team understanding how that person does their work and how they can do their work. It basically involves the team getting together and figuring out how to work together the best way possible. And I think that's what that Kanban team did with their low vision person. They just got together in a retrospective and said, how can we solve this challenge? Even though we use Kanban. Okay, good? Okay. Oh. Okay? Okay. I've been told it's okay. All right. See, getting back to your question, I think it's the team figuring it out. All right, welcome back. So we're going to talk about limiting whip. Limiting whip or work in process is the second Kanban practice. You can see here that this service delivery manager is only working on one sword at a time. So this same concept exists in Kanban teams. How do you work on one thing at a time? When you work on one thing at a time, you get things done more quickly. But is it truly the most powerful Kanban practice? I can tell you from experience, many, many Kanban teams I've been on do not limit work and process at all. In fact, they never set whip limits in their Kanban, which is what you're supposed to do. And if they do have whip limits, 
a Kanban team will violate those lip whip limits pretty quickly. They do it all the time. So Kanban teams don't set whip limits. And then if they do, they violate them. And finally, a lot of Kanban teams have an expedite lane where all the work becomes high priority in that lane and it automatically violates all whip limits. So teams, successful Kanban teams, often don't limit work and yet they're successful. So this also must not be the most important Kanban practice. What about the third practice then? This is for the service request managers. And that third practice is managing flow. Just like that wizard is managing the flow of that potion. In a Kanban, you should be able to see the work flow through the system. That's what Heidi was talking about earlier today, the Kanban team wanting to see the work flow through on a daily basis. But is it really that important to practice? Many Kanban teams create a column in their Kanban for blocked work, which immediately blocks flow. Some Kanban teams don't even figure out how their work is represented in their Kanban. The columns in the Kanban are supposed to represent the work flowing through the system. They may not have an interpretation of how their work flows through their columns at all, in which case they don't see any flow in the Kanban. Or they might use a generic workflow for their Kanban to do in process done. You can't see flow at all where the work is, where it's going, where it's been. Or maybe they have a really rigid workflow where a Kanban team's Kanban board is applied across an entire company. 50 Kanban teams all using the same workflow, even though they do their work in different ways. And yet these Kanban teams are still successful to a certain extent. So that also means that managing flow is not the most powerful practice. Make your policies explicit. Just like this accredited Kanban consultant is writing down the rules of the road for his team. Every Kanban team is supposed to make their rules of how they work together and how the work gets done explicit. But many Kanban teams never make those policies explicit. You're supposed to write the rules of how the work flows through the system on sticky notes above each column. Here's how work enters the column. Here's how work exits the column. Kind of like a definition already or a definition of done on a scrum team. A Kanban team does the same thing. Here's how work moves from column to column. But many Kanban teams never make that explicit. Many Kanban teams never come up with those policies at all. And if even if they do come up with those policies, they violate them very frequently. So even though this is a powerful Kanban practice, it can't be the most powerful one. Which brings us to feedback loops for the accredited Kanban trainers. Scrum has feedback loops at the end of every sprint the sprint review and the sprint retrospective. Well, in Kanban teams, we like feedback too. But in Kanban, there are no iterations. How do you get feedback loops if you have no iterations? There are no sprints. Some Kanban teams, because they have no iterations, never have a retrospective, ever. So how do they get those feedback loops and still be successful Kanban teams? So 
Feedback loops also can't be the most important practice. We've just covered the five practices. And I told you they're not very powerful, although they are crucial for Kanban teams. So what is the most powerful practice? That's for the Kanban coach. The most powerful practice, the one that rules them all, is improvement and evolution. And in fact, let's learn the six practices. There are also six principles in Kanban. I'll go over those really quickly. The first principle in Kanban, start with what you do now. You don't have to change your process at all. You can just start using Kanban. The second principle, agree to pursue improvement through evolutionary change. The third principle, encourage acts of leadership at every level. The fourth principle, understand and focus on customer needs and expectations. The fifth principle, manage the work and let people self-organize around it. And finally, the sixth principle, policies control service delivery. All right. So you've learned the six practices. You've learned the six principles. And I've said that the most powerful practice is improve and evolve. Here's why. Look at principle number two. Improvement and evolution is so powerful that it is not only a practice, but a principle in Kanban. It is the only one like that. That's why that is the one ring to rule them all. If there's one thing a successful Kanban team has to do, it's improve and evolve. All the other practices are useful. All the other principles are useful, but this is the most powerful one. Evolution can be good or bad. You can change things and evolve, and they might not work. Or they might work. But one thing is for certain. If you stop evolving, you will die. And that's the most critical thing on a GAMAD team. And in fact... I'd like to share a quote from a good friend of mine. That's Jim Benson. Jim Benson is the, uh, one of the founders of the Kanban movement. He's the co-creator of uh, Lean Coffee. You may have heard of Lean Coffee. And this is what Jim says. You improve or you wallow inexpensive amateurism. So what Jim is saying here is that on a truly professional team, you have to invest in improving and evolving. Otherwise, you're just an amateur. Now, thank you for your patience today. We had a lot of technical challenges. I'm very invested in the Agile community. I speak at conferences all over the world. I help organize conferences, volunteer, attend, speak. And I'm very glad to see all of you today because you are investing in improving and evolving. And that's the most powerful Kanban practice. And if you wanna learn more about the Agile community, Go ahead, check out my book. It kind of explains how you can get involved more. And thank you very much. I appreciate your time. And I believe we have time for questions now. Thank you. Domo negato.
Oh, we've got a question in the room here. You ready? Um, so uh, I am working as an agile coach for my company, Naxa Japan. And uh, we are introducing, um, we've been doing, we've been trying to do Scrum in sprints. But, uh, you know, there are certain uh, projects or product ways of thinking that works in sprints and some don't. So uh, I've introduced to some teams Kanban. <laughs> um, but I'm also curious to hear from your perspective and experience uh, what kind of products or projects are suited for Kanban versus sprints and scrum? I'll let you translate that for a second. So the question is, is what's suitable? Okay, cool. So the question is, what should you use Kanban for or not? What should you use Scrum for or not? Remember how I told you I grew up at Microsoft? Hmm. Uh, on my first Scrum team, Kanban wasn't really a thing yet. So we used Scrum for everything. So I never found a project where I couldn't get Scrum to work somehow. And it's true today, the reverse as well. I've never found a project where I couldn't get Kanban to work too. I guess my message here is that you can figure it out by reflecting and slowly evolving and changing Scrum and Kanban to suit your purposes. Now, in day-to-day -day life, Kanban works really great for like uh, chaos, services, um, and Scrum really works well when you've got like a product delivery cadence. Those are generally what I would say that they're really suited for. But if you try hard, you can use them for anything. Does that help? Cool. All right, what other questions? Don't be shy. Did you let the artificial intelligence do the right. No, I painted all those myself. <laughs> and the question was, uh, who created the artwork on the slides? No, that is AI art. Yeah, yeah, it's pretty cool. Yeah. Cool. Yeah, yeah, it looks pretty One of the best slides I've seen so far. So. No, I did do the one with Jim Benson. All right, what other questions do we have in the room? You know, one of the five scrum values is courage. Who has the courage to ask me a question? Uh, I knew it would happen. Could you maybe tell us something about um, your experience with improving and, and what could you tell us about how to reach great improvement? Specifically on a Kanban team, I can go into a company and I'll walk around the company, do like a gimbal walk, right? And I'll see all the dead Kanban boards lying around the office. The sticky notes have faded in the sun. They're like in a corner. Nobody's updated that Kanban board in like three years. I've been at places like that. They created a Kanban board three years ago, but I haven't updated it. A dead Kanban board is dead because it's stopped evolving. On a Kanban team, the Kanban board is a visual manifestation of how the team works. So if the Kanban board dies because it stops evolving, it means the team stopped evolving, which means the team probably stopped reflecting and improving and changing. 
What that means on a Kanban team is that things never stay the same. They're always changing how they do their work in very small increments. So you need to have some kind of process where the team gets together on a frequent basis and talks about how to evolve. I've seen Kanban teams evolve their Kanban in their daily standup. I've seen teams like do it at offsites. I've seen teams do it at some kind of retrospective activity, but somehow they have to figure out how to evolve because if they stop evolving, they die. Three more minutes. I got time for one more question. Oh, here we go. Uh, thank you very much. So actually, uh, if one team, um, Kanban team, um, wants to collaborate with the team who, which is uh, adopting Kanban, not Kanban, like a Scrum or a waterfall yeah. with strict uh, deadline. Yeah. So uh, if they want to create one single product, for let's say one library, yeah. how to collaborate with the um, different uh, team with different methodology? Mm. Yeah, great. So the question is essentially about dependencies between a Kanban team and another team, whatever they use, right? <clears throat> One of the practices is visualization. The most effective technique to manage those inter-team dependencies on a Kanban team is visualization. So... If you have a piece of work in your Kanban team, you write on the sticky note, hey, this work has a dependency on another team. So you make dependencies visual on your Kanban board. I mean, you can do it however you want, pink sticky notes, or maybe you put the word dependency on the sticky note. Or another one I've seen is you have a, row in your Kanban board that's dedicated to dependent work. So all the sticky notes in this row depend on other teams. So you're tracking your dependencies or visualizing your dependencies on a Kanban team. When you can start to do that on a Kanban team, then you can start having conversations about what the dependencies are when are they due? Are we going to have challenges? But first, you have to make them visual. All right. That's time. It is 1.45. Uh, I do know a little more Japanese. Are you ready? Don't want to Okay, I'm done. <laughs> sorry, I'm so sorry for the much of technical problems. Thank you, everyone. いいよね。よびますね。そのその最初トラブルがあったようで申し訳ございませんでした。ありがとうございました。無事に良かったです。はい。私もちょっとオンラインなので会場の人に聞いてますね。いや、私別の通訳セッションに出ていて、これは出てなかったですね。はい、少々お待ちください。いや、I <笑> <Yeah, I>, <笑>